that we're accomplishing with the governor's executive order 16 and 34, permitting electronic meetings to be suspended. Um, can anyone go ahead and give a second for that motion, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. Aye. Um, we're going to just. Julie, do you have enough or do you see hands? I can't see hands. I, I don't see hands. If we could do. Um, can we do a roll call? Majorly, I think, we're, yeah, we're supposed to do a roll call. So I can do that because since I can see everybody, I, I did hear from um, Brady and Rajiv and then obviously Claire, Brian. Yeah, accept them. Thank you. And then Amna. Can uh, uh, Dr. Hill do that? I'm here. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Hildreth? Yes, I'm here. Uh, and Dr. Kelly? I'm here. Thank you. That's everyone, Dr. Bullock. Okay, thank you. Um, do we have any... Um, Looks like we, we just need to look to review the minutes from the last meeting um, and do an approval of the minutes, Claire. Do you um, want to go ahead and do that? Um, we had a couple of updates we were going to run through real quick, I think. Um, uh, during the section of the agenda, I, I just wanted to update the advisory council um, since we had discussed this uh, two meetings ago that um, we have convened a coordinating committee or a leadership team of um, approximately 11 um, folks from, from many of your agencies who are um, coming together and charged with taking um, the prioritization that the advisory council um, has, has completed along with um, those strategic frames that uh, you applied to um, that um, back at again, two meetings ago, I think, uh, to help inform what are our next steps, what um, work groups uh, need to be rolled out, um, as well as uh, other key kind of strategic um, issues that come up, um, especially in light of COVID. So they had that team has met twice um, and I'm just very excited to have uh, that group pulled together and, and rolling along. And if you have any questions about it, um, Claire and Brady are also uh, both a part of that. And um, if you have any questions about that team, uh, you can reach out to any of us. Um, I, I, I know that there was a thread kind of hanging at the last meeting. I didn't want to just not circle back to it at all. Um, although I don't know from our end of that small group that had originally been pulled together, we were able to um, advance much on um, HIV testing. Um, uh, in terms of figuring out how to align with COVID testing or um, uh, any additional uh, testing, at, at least at the agencies that were involved in that conversation. Um, however, I did hear uh, about Nashville Cares doing a drive-through event and, and Anna, if you want to, um, not to put you on the spot, but if you have any uh, updates you'd like to share from that, um, successes or challenges that could help inform the rest of the council on um, the challenges of, of, of testing in this time. Yeah, hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me, Julie? Yeah, we um, we actually had a testing, uh, the drive through last uh, Friday. Um, we had it from seven to five o'clock in the afternoon, pretty hot day, but we had 18 people come through and um, it was pretty seamless, but the shocking um, outcome was we had two folks that tested positive in such a small cohort. So that was um, really telling that there's, you know, a need for testing and to get, um, make sure that we're actually getting information out and reaching folks during this COVID uh, pandemic. 
Uh, the good news was we were able to link them very quickly um, into care um, and, you know, be able to, they're both actually uh, seeing a provider right now, but uh, pretty shocking. We didn't expect that. Um, and so we're, we're going to be looking to do one each month, um, I think, and trying to really market and promote it um, as much as possible. I think one of the challenges was just really being able to promote it and, and get more people um, to come to the testing event is, I think, one of the things that kind of lessons learned looking back is to start to promote it earlier and at different platforms and different places. So. I think that, um, you know, any way that uh, we at the table can help promote it too. You know, I, I, have, I have the EHE newsletter. I, I, you know, I had found out from uh, Dr. Link about that event and I promoted it through there, but I know that uh, other folks in, in this um, space have, you know, um, a bigger reach to maybe um, cross promotion would, would be helpful to you. I'd be happy to do some of that. Yeah, that would be really great. Yep. And we're still doing kind of also a couple with that is the home kits, uh, sending out the testing kits to folks and kind of doing the counseling piece via phone to really help them support them as they administer the test. And we've also identified uh, some positives through the um, home testing too. So it's, um, it kind of speaks to the importance of really making sure that we continue testing in the community. But thank you, Julie. Thank you, Pamna. Um, Claire, did you want to go next or have Brady go next? Let's hear what Brady has to say. I'll go after him. Hey, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Brady Edscorn Morris. Uh, I am a member of the uh, HIV modernization movement. This is um, an organization that began last year to try to get the HIV criminalization laws um, in the state of Tennessee changed to reflect science. I don't know how familiar everybody, er, everyone is with, with that structure, um, but the state of Tennessee is one of 32 states that has an HIV specific statute on the books um, to prosecute those of us living with HIV uh, for non-disclosure. Um, these laws to begin with are just bad public health policy. Um, but um, these laws, in effect, actually do a lot more harm than, than good. Um, the modernization movement, last year we were able to write a bill and present it to our state legislature. Um, Representative Clemens was the sponsor on the representative side, um, and we were trucking along, getting a lot of movement. But then um, we realized that on the Senate Democrats side, they were still pushing back on some of the changes that we were proposing in the bill, mostly that being uh, reducing the charge from a felony to a misdemeanor. Um, and at that point, we realized that a lot more education needed to go on within the, the halls of our legislature. So we kind of um, dropped the bill for last year. And this year, we are going to be focusing more on education and trying to get everyone on the same page, because there's a lot of misconceptions um, even within the community as to what these HIV laws actually mean and how they're applied to those of us living with HIV. Um, so we are going to be progressing the work, though, during this COVID time. We're working right now to get uh, some information packets set up, and those are our next steps. Awesome. Thanks, Brady. I'll um, do a quick update here. Um, I think most of you probably know me already. Um, I'm Claire Bolds. I'm one of the co-chairs of the council, um, and I'm also a program manager for the Tennessee AIDS Education and Training Center. Um, so I wanted to give you a quick update on something that Julie and I have been sort of working on behind the scenes. Um, in the EHE plan that was developed, there was a recommendation to increase um, access to PrEP, or sorry, access to PEP, non-occupational PEP specifically, in emergency departments. And we thought this might be a little bit low-hanging fruit, something that we could sort of work on, um, or at least begin exploring um, and not take up a lot of the council's time with it. Um, so we had a really productive call with um, uh, stakeholders from the Sexual Assault Center, 
um, Vanderbilt, uh, the student health providers there, um, Nashville General, and uh, the uh, Metro Police Department. So both hospitals, um, and sorry, the, to be clear, at Vanderbilt, there there are providers um, at the hospital that specifically also work with the student population. So um, both hospitals offer PEP initiation and include a three-day supply of the medication um, to people who present needing in PEP. Um, and they're either referred to the Walgreens Specialty Pharmacy or the Vanderbilt Pharmacy. They did talk about a lot of barriers to uh, PEP use or PEP in initiation. And one of the surprising things to me is that a lot of patients were really um, put off by the 28-day commitment to taking PEP. So that was a little bit interesting. Um, also, of course, a barrier that we always hear about is payment. Um, so out of pocket, it's really expensive. Tin care is difficult to work with. Um, if uh, somebody has insurance, there's often a pretty high copay, or it's kind of complicated to get assistance for the copay. Um, and uh, some people really don't want to utilize their insurance, especially this was an issue with the Vanderbilt uh, provider that we spoke with a lot of the students at Vanderbilt are still on their parents' insurance and they don't want um, the EOB to go to their parents or sometimes even their partner. Um, and then uh, a lot of people didn't seem to, uh, they, they seem sort of aware of the manufacturer program for PEP, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but the um, paperwork was an issue um, and also there was an issue that for people who don't want to use their insurance, um, they really have to use their insurance um, if they have it available. There's no option to sort of waive it. So um, uninsured is at, people who are uninsured actually ended up being some of the um, folks who have the easiest time accessing PEP. So um, we've started thinking about ways that we can address some of these barriers. Um, I was really impressed to hear um, everyone on the call talking about how they really do make PEP a priority and really offer it to anybody that they think might benefit from it. So I was really happy to hear that. Um, so it, it's really these barriers that I think we need to focus on. And one solution that we came up with, um, and I'm, we are very open to hearing um, other people's suggestions, um, but Music City Prep has um, said that they are able to provide PEP um, and there aren't a lot of strings attached really. So if somebody has insurance, but they don't want to use their insurance, that's okay. They can um, work with them to get free PEP um, no matter what their sort of insurance situation is. So, um, and they're also able to do telehealth and, um, you know, potentially um, sort of have a no contact um, situation when prescribing the, the PEP to somebody. So um, of course, people would still need to access the medication itself. They would need to go somewhere to get that. So transportation might be a barrier for some folks still. Um, but that's sort of um, the broad view. There's still uh, some work to be done on this and I'm happy to um, here, if anybody else has suggestions for avenues that we should explore. Hey, Claire, this is Sean. I think that's a terrific uh, development with Music City Prep. Do you know what regimen they'd be able to provide? But is it Travada, Deli Tagavir, Travada, Ralph Tagavir? I did not ask that. I can find out. Any other questions or comments before we move on? Claire, do you know do you know how what, what model they're using to provide it? Because um, if it's a model that can be duplicated elsewhere in the city, um, for example, I know that my house is now doing sort of a similar model of a case mix of insured and uninsured patients with the 340B pharmacy and then using revenue. 
um, for the costs associated with PrEP. Um, and if Music City PrEP is using that model to pay for PrEP, then it could potentially be duplicated. I sort of assumed that that's the model yeah. PrEP is using, um, but I didn't really get specifics on it. And I, I just ha I had a few of my questions answered over email. We haven't had like a comprehensive call about it. Okay. Um, but um, maybe you and I could set a call with <laughs> Sure. somebody um it sounds like little, you have the good questions <laughs> well what seems a little different is that if somebody wants to use their insurance they don't have to which tells me that they have a supply on hand how they're getting that supply whether it be i don't know how they get it whether it be donated from the drug companies or i don't know if they can purchase wholesale um but by not using somebody's i, I just don't know how that would work yeah i don't either okay. Um, but yeah, we can we can explore that. Those are good questions. Cool. All right. Um, in that case, we will move on to uh, approval of the minutes from our uh, July meeting. Um, and the minutes were provided to everyone in advance. Um, hopefully, everyone's had an opportunity to review. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to sort of move ahead. Um, so I'll go ahead and ask, does anyone have any amendments to the minutes? Okay. Um, would someone make a motion to approve? Brian, motions? Any seconds? I'll second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Got two. All right, I just see two people voting. Okay, I think we need a couple more. Aye. It's Dr. Hildreth. All right. Aye. Aye. Aye, this is Amna. Okay, I think that's probably enough, right, Julie? <laughs> do we need to be unanimous? I don't know. I don't think so. And actually, I need to go back and look at Robert's rules because I don't know that we have to vote on minutes technically, but that might be in our in the council's bylaws. So um, let me do the math here. One, two, three, four, and another Hildreth. I think we need, um, well, that's more than have a quorum. Yes, we're good. All right, great. I will toss it back to you, Dr. Bullock. You there, Dr. Bullock? She might be having uh, audio issues again. Can you guys hear me? We got you now. Okay, that's very strange. I'm on my phone, but it's going through my computer. I'm not really sure. Anyway, um, so you can hear me. Um, we our, our next action is approval approval of the nominations and recruitment plan. So I'm going to just talk very briefly, um, kind of what this looks like and kind of what we are trying to do here. Um, so when this um, council was formed, um, the drafting of the nominations and recruitment plan was delegated to the equity work group um, as inclusion equity metrics are part of that charge to that total work group. Um, the nominations and recruitment plan was sent with the rest of the council's documents last week um, through your email. Um, it is up for discussion and vote today. Um, and we are creating, while we are creating a plan for making nominations to the mayor, we want to keep in mind that it's ultimately the mayor's discretion to actually appoint the members. Um, so I'm going to take just a few minutes and go through some of the highlights in the nominations and recruitment plan and just kind of do a few quick reminders about what this looks like. Um, the advisory council um, obviously should have a minimum of 13 people, a maximum of 25 um, that are appointed by the mayor. Um, initially, the council was appointed with rolling terms. Um, subsequent terms from here on out as they are nominated will be in three-year increments. Um, candidates to fill the vacancies in the advisory council membership shall be nominated by the advisory council and recommended by the mayor. Um, nominations must be based on a recruitment plan developed by us. So just going through some of the composition of this. 
Um, also remain, remembering that a quorum for approving decisions made by the advisory council shall consist of the majority of the currently filled positions of the advisory council and that they, um, members shall serve without compensation. Um, so I'm just going to go and just do a few, um, reminders. This is the plan from the nominations and recruitment plan. Um, just kind of go through some of the objectives. This document was sent out as well, so this is just kind of a high overview. Um, wanted to talk about how the, con the council membership um, defined radical inclusion. Um, pretty extensive definition. Um, really want it boils down to radical inclusion means creating a space where diverse and democratic group um, of viewpoints informs our discussions and our decisions. Um, want to make sure that the membership on the council should represent many diverse sectors, skill sets, and following the guidance is offered with respect to council membership, demographic sectors, and skill sets. Um, in terms of the demographics, um, we want to make sure that it's a minimum of 65 percent of the council should reflect the health disparities of Nashville's HIV positive population, including members who are black or African American, other communities of color, including those who are Hispanic or Latino. Um, membership should be inclusive and not ex excessively dominated by either males or females. And membership should be inclusive of persons who are LGBTQ and should include intersections of those communities, um, including but not limited to black trans women, black um, males having six males under 35. Membership should be non-discriminatory based on gender identity or expression. Um, some of the sectors that we want to make sure that we include are aid service organizations, the Ryan White Planning Council, um, youth focused or youth serving organizations, um, prep and prevention service providers, hospitals, um, the Metro Health Department, um, behavioral health service providers, faith based organizations in the state of Tennessee um, as well. Some of the skill sets that we want to be inclusive of are infectious disease clinicians and healthcare, community health work, peer recovery or support, advocacy, communications, PR marketing, policy or law, health planning, strategic planning, health education, and prevention. Um, currently, right now, um, in terms of an application, um, candidates are placed into nominations, shall submit an application for review by the council. Um, the application, we are working on a kind of a modified application, if you will, but should basically include a short response on the various, various demographic skills and sectors the provincial member will represent, um, the member's personal philosophy and priorities for the um, council, and the member's reason for wanting to be a part of the council with the signed acknowledgement committing to the attendance requirements set forth in the bylaws. Uh, once all nominations are reviewed, um, the council will make a recommendation. Um, and then provide that to um, the mayor's terms or the mayor's um, for appointment. Um, like I said, vacancies, vacancies can be filled for up to three years. Um, so we are looking to um, have any input as far as this is concerned today. Um, Julie, did you get a chance to do a modified form? I know we had talked about that and whether or not we were going to kind of review that. Um, so I don't know if that got sent out as well. I did. I sent sent it out yesterday. It's um, pretty straight. Okay. Can you all can you all see it pulled up here? Um, so yeah, just basically as you were going through it, pretty much everything you said. Um, okay. One thing that the um, that the equity team had noted was rather than asking people to check boxes around race, sexuality, um, ethnicity, uh, and those kind of things, allowing people to self-describe um, what they will represent, what, what perspectives they're representing on the council. Um, and that's really kind of the only thing I, I had to note on that. Thank you, Julie. That looks actually great. Um, just kind of uh, minimizes the application process versus somebody having to write all that out. Um, additionally, we want to make sure that um, while we currently have um, kind of a full set of people, we can go up to 25. And just keeping in mind that this could potentially be a long process um, in terms of getting this through. Um, I don't recall in the bylaws whether or not this had to be voted on during actual meetings um, or if we could do it offline in terms of nomination. Um, even if we had somebody, you know, we talked about it today, somebody nominated, we extend the application to them, 
bring that in, review it at the next meeting, um, and make a nomination for appointment and provide that. So it really could probably be about a three-month process. So keeping that in mind when we do um, make nominations for people and have people apply. Um, does anybody have any questions or discussion um, around the application process um, or any of the um, discussion that we just had in terms of the nomination and recruitment plan um, as we move forward? No discussion, suggestions? Um, I'll take that as everybody is, is um, all okay with what we've discussed and okay with moving forward. Um, with that being said, um, we'll go ahead and, and make a motion, I'll have somebody make a motion for a vote um, for this plan going forward. I motion. Need a second. I second. All in favor? Aye. I'm trying to do the math again. <laughs> of who I heard. <laughs> I think we're giving you just a few minutes. Um, so I've got uh, Claire um, as making the motion, Dr. Hildreth seconding, um, Brady, um, Rajiv, Brian, did you vote to approve? Did you raise your hand? Um, and then um, did I hear Dr. Kelly as well? Yes, I approve. Anyone else want to, to voice here? I, I think that's more than half of me. Yes, Emma. Thank you, Emma. More than half of quorum. More of half of it. Okay. Thank you, Julie. Um, as we move forward in the agenda, I um, also just want to, um, if there are any potential nominations today, we, we can go ahead and um, take those and then reach out if anybody has any or if anybody wants to send Julie an email after this um, as we do have some positions that are expiring but we do have some flexibility in increasing that even before those expire even if they choose to expand um, so I'll just open it up if anybody has anything if not we can send those to Julie after You can also, um, if, if council members prefer, you could reach out to um, said person and see if they're interested and um, send them the application directly. Um, it has instructions on it to, to, for how to send it back in to me. And then um, once I get them in, I'll, I'll figure out a secure way of, of getting them to the rest of the, the council members to review. I guess hearing um, nothing else on that, or, um, I, I think we're okay to move on. Um, my update from uh, the previous advisory council meeting, um, you know, we talked about how, how are we aligning under this EAG umbrella? Um, and, you know, what is an opportunity to communicate to the public um, under this umbrella of EHE, um, building towards, I think, building some um, groundwork and foundation for um, later communications campaigns, um, which I know is in uh, the implementation plan for EHE, but a lot of those are very expensive and ambitious. And, um, you know, this would start to uh, provide some of that framework, or at least that's the idea. So there was some you know, conversation around that at the previous meeting. I think there was uh, a lot of agreement among the council members that it was important to do that. 
Um, so this was something that was um, brought to the leadership team at their last meeting to, um, you know, briefly talk through thinking of World AIDS Day as an opportunity for a launch of something that would be ongoing. Um, um, what priority, what of the five priority areas from the council um, to move forward with and overwhelmingly um, stigma was advanced by that group as um, um, addressing and reducing stigma of persons living with HIV, which was one of the council's top five, five priorities was um, moved forward as um, um, what to address through this communication. Of course, that is very large and there's a lot of opportunities for stigma. So we had to break that down a little bit. Um, and uh, so we talked through um, long term, you know, what impacts do we want to see? What um, behavior changes do we want? And really, you know, what knowledge is going to lead to that, those behavior changes? Um, and um, decided on a theme of let's talk about it for World AIDS Day 2020. And the idea um, that came out of that group was, um, you know, even just talking about experiences of a person living with HIV in 2020 compared to what a person's perceptions might, you know, be of um, HIV, um, which is, you know, probably in a lot of cases really dated. Um, but that, you know, this is not something so unspeakable that we can't um, talk about it because not talking about it is, um, in fact, stigmatizing. So um, this is just a one pager that I sent out kind of threw together for you all to look at. Um, want to pull together a team um, from the leadership team. There were several volunteers to be a part of that team to start um, uh, planning World AIDS Day events, virtual events, um, and um, really around that um, theme of talking about it, moving into 2021, um, continuing to promote um, different opportunities for engaging with different sectors, um, uh, including community members, people living with HIV themselves, providers um, and policymakers and community leaders, um, particularly faith leaders. Um, and I think from what um, Reverend Sanders communicated in um, our previous meeting was, we know that there are people who are in the community who have um, the trust of the community. And if this first initiative is really to build the bridge to the people who have the trust um, and get their support and um, understanding, then that will set us up for the next phase of you know really getting to um, our, the, the populations that are um, most at risk. So the asks to the advisory council today, one is always um, for feedback. Um, if you have any thoughts on um, this in general, uh, to participate as ABLE in World AIDS Day events. I know that a lot of organizations have their own events, um, but we are, uh, we'll be happy to cross promote um, and as ABLE, um, just as we kind of formulate what the plan is for this um, as participants, panelists, speakers. Um, and then if you have agency staff who you want to be a part of the planning team, um, please um, just have them reach out to me or you can um, make that connection. Any discussion or thoughts on this? And, and bring Claire both a part of that team too. So if you all want to jump in and um, share anything about how this came together. So are we thinking about doing a, an event ourselves or uh, hosting an event or, or are we uh, uh, more soft, like providing support to other groups that are um, uh, doing the event? Yeah, so the idea is to under um, the EHE umbrella, create our own events. Um, but then additionally promote other events happening in the community. 
um, that organizations are planning. And if organizations want to kind of um, do joint events too, if it's you know EHE and Metro Public Health Department, for example, or um, EHE and Nashville Cares, um, that's totally possible too. I do think this uh, ties in well with what Brady spoke about earlier with modernization um, of HIV laws. And uh, Julie, I think it was you that I was talking to the other day and you said really talking to members of the legislature is one thing and it's important, but um, almost more important is getting the word out in the community about things like U equals U that um, sort of uh, decrease stigma within the Nashville community and um, get the constituents on board with changing these laws. The question I have is, um, so you said stigma, is, so is, the, uh, like, um, is there like a slogan, logo, uh, I mean, not logo, slogan, or kind of like a central idea other than, I mean, like just, is it reducing stigma in the community? What exactly is the overarching uh, goal um, that we're looking at? So um, I think the overall goal is, it, with the, the ultimate goal is yes, decreasing stigma, but I think um, the means that we're using to get there is um, just through increasing conversations in the community about what it's like to have HIV in 2020. And I think there are a lot of people out there who really still think of HIV like we're living in the Dallas Buyers Club world. and. Um, really haven't updated their knowledge since then. And they would be absolutely blown away by a concept like U equals U. So the idea is to um, destigmatize talking about having HIV and sharing what that's like and what it's like to be taking antiretrovirals. And um, I think the idea is that by talking about this more we will be decreasing stigma amongst the people that are at least willing to listen. Yeah, I think it's um, part of its level setting, even with providers, and that's often the case, um, you know, in, in various public health initiatives is um, when you're advancing science, uh, not all the practitioners are coming along at the same speed as you. So it's not, um, you know, just with one particular community, but how um, can uh, we advance the conversation in, in all these different areas? Um, sure to, as, as like, I'm just kind of like, I, I read through um, this, but again, it was like, for me, it's like, at the end of the day, who's our audience? Is it the community itself? Is it specific? Uh, stakeholders um, or is it going to be like specific events are going to be focused to one particular group or you know so what's kind of like who, who's our audience in this yeah so the the leadership team actually segmented this out into four um, different audience groups so each event would be targeted to that specific audience group um, policymakers and community leaders if, if you're um, following along in here um, they're kind of we also call these lay people um, and um, you know, community members that aren't directly impacted um, in any way um, as a stakeholder, um, but who have an opportunity to um, either intentionally or unintentionally through their words and actions stigmatize um, someone else. Um, people living with HIV um, and, um, you know, targeting um, this population uh, specifically around um, you know, self-stigma, uh, but also providing opportunities to have um, peers act as uh, informal um, kind of uh, community health workers support um, how uh, peers can uh, engage with each other. And then um, also people living with HIV engaging outside of, um, you know, specific community 
community events that are um, specific to people living with HIV with the idea of, you know, the more you're participating um, in groups that are external to um, maybe, you know, kind of an insular group um, and, and just showing your presence um, uh, that in itself uh, destigmatizing. So this is kind of the behavior change that, you know, we're, we're um, seeking to, to move, but it's through, um, you know, kind of just this process of um, sharing knowledge and um, support. Um, providers, um, specific actions that um, the leadership team wanted to promote during the next year are uh, teaching providers how to take a sexual history um, at a routine health appointment and providing opt-out testing for HIV as able. Um, those would obviously be, you know, a little bit different than other events where it would be, you know, specifically more, um, you know, training and Q&A and coaching around how to um, answer certain questions and um, and then providing education to clients on, on U equals U. Um, and so for policymakers, the real main ask, um, you know, uh, for example, we would want, um, you know, maybe our Board of Health or um, the Mayor's Office to declare, um, to uh, recognize Awareness Day, such as World AIDS Day, um, whenever there's an opportunity to do that. And that's that's kind of, you know, as far as we went with policymakers kind of in, in this iteration, um, and um, but but more community leaders like faith leaders um, building that bridge into the community. So um, by building um, their own awareness about um, current science. And I apologize for how many times I just said um, I heard it. Um, your neighborhood troublemaker. Um, so is there any funding? Uh, that we have in stores that they would have to like uh, come from agencies who are kind of like planning it. Yeah, um, we don't have any funding secured yet. And, um, you know, so some of these could be similar to the panel we did for uh, Take Pride in Your Health, where, you know, we're using kind of our human resources and the resources we have. Um, you know, it's a very unique time to be planning events like this. And I know agency budgets um, may be stretched. And um, this is a particular day where you're looking um, to fundraise for your own organization, perhaps, and um, promoting um, events within your own organization. Um, However, in the past, there have been times with, with councils like this where if it is a um, collaborative event that um, different agencies uh, contribute. So uh, we didn't move forward with planning yet. Uh, you know, the idea was to bring it to this group first. So um, depending on the scale, and I see Brian. Yeah. I um, it, it's, it's, I don't know, I, this is a really big list of a whole bunch of topics. And the, the, I, I think when, when I think about World AIDS Day, it's the one chance that we have to get local media writing a sing, all writing or telling a single story. The, the, but they're only going to tell one story. And if, if we wanted to, make the most of that and sort of amplify a very specific message, it might be helpful to say that, you know, uh, the focus is on we're going to promote condom use or we're going to promote testing or we're going to promote prep. But I, I, I just I feel like there's only one story that gets told in each media organization. And to the extent that we really want to focus on something, maybe we want to be intentional about choosing that theme and seeing how we can reinforce that theme it's working collectively so that that we really do have a, a, a much bigger I mean again if, if all of the stories are saying the same thing this year um, we might have an outsized impact versus lots of different stories that to say different things and it just gets kind of lost yeah that's a really good point Brian and this list is really thinking into 2021 long term um, but 
I certainly think that once the planning team is convened, they'll um, narrow it down to this is our, our target, target audience. This is what we want to be talking about um, around advancing science. So, um, and, it, and it may be, and, and certainly would want the input on if you think there's, you know, one specific ask to community members or to any of these groups that we want to be pushing um, on World AIDS Day. Um, we'd love Maybe to. This is this is Amna. Um, I agree with Brian um, to have one focus, especially during the time of COVID, when there's a, a few issues that are going on that um, are concerning. Uh, the issue is getting people to know their HIV status and getting tested during a time of COVID is critical. It's evident that people are still continuing to have sex at this time, but don't have the ability to know their HIV status uh, due to the limitations of social distancing and kind of organizations not being fully open and available for testing. So I think that's one issue. The other issue is that we're experiencing people living with HIV um, making sure that they are retained in care and are accessing care during this time and the importance of continuing uh, to adhere to medication and receive, you know, the necessary care that they need, uh, knowing that disproportionately um, folks that are from communities of color, especially African-American communities, are already prior to COVID have had challenges and barriers related to social determinants of health and others that impede them from accessing you know, care and being retained in care, and some of them are even lost to care. So I think that uh, as we start to think about kind of a COVID era that we're trying to look at World AIDS Day, uh, we do need to be impactful and really be able to focus and hone in into uh, you know, one or two things that kind of really, we can all come together and, and, and decide what it is for our community versus kind of having a long list that really, to Brian's points, dilutes our message and is not impactful and effective. So one quick comment, and thank, thank you, Amna, I, I appreciate that, I, I agree with you. Um, I, we, when I think, one of the, the, the parts about World AIDS Day that's a little bit um, challenging is the places that we most want to do testing, it's dark that time of year, and so it poses security concerns to do outdoor testing. Um, so, you know, we, we've got a, especially like the Napier, Sudicum, Casey neighborhoods, you, we, you know, you have to be out by 4.30 that time of year. Um, but, and, and even when you start getting to South Nolensville, uh, what we what willing to do is just promote, if, if this, if we wanted to unify behind the theme of testing, um, I, I, we can, all of our clinics could have a special testing, um, out, you know, a walk-up testing site outdoors. I, you know, I, I know that Nashville Cares it could, could easily probably do some, some testing events. We could figure out a coordinated, massive Know Your Status Day. Um, and then, you know, to the extent that we wanted to do prep literature on top of that, we can provide that in real time. Conversely, if this if the group says no, 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 let's not do testing, let's do prep promotion, that's fine too. Uh, we, we can figure out how to sort of organize around that. But I, I think Amna is exactly right. Um, the the pandemic, the focus on the pandemic, especially when the vaccine stuff becomes available, is going to drown out whatever limited message we might have or, or limit our ability to have a, a really loud message. So. I'd love to work collaboratively and figure out how we can really knock it out of the park and, and really have a breakthrough with the media and most importantly with, with the outcomes we're looking toward. Um, and I, I think just from a mayoral standpoint, um, having the mayor out front talking about this, getting tested or doing whatever he'd want to do, it, it, it would bring a lot of publicity to this, right, the right type of publicity to this effort and to, to the city, to, the, to Metro and to the Metro Public Health Department. Brian, did I hear you volunteer to be on the planning team? Um, I, I, I would, I, I am a really happy to support that, um, but I, we are <laughs> snowed over with pandemic response right now. So I think if you told me you need outdoor testing, um, I'll tell you, great, here's what we'll do. But I, I, I really, I, I should be, I can't commit to that right now and I apologize. I understood. Um, any other information on this? Just to um, circle back, um, yes, yeah, um, 
complete and complete agreement that it needs to be um, clear and unified and maybe was um, a choice to overwhelm you with the, the kind of big picture idea here. Um, but the idea is kind of, you know, if it's HIV testing, there's an opportunity to tell a story there, right? Um, and have a conversation and have a dialogue that would promote um, testing. And that's, that's what I'm hearing as kind of the main piece of feedback from this council. And I know that that's been, a huge challenge. So does anybody else want to weigh in on that before we move on to the um, next piece of the agenda? Julie, this is Dr. Hildreth. Uh, for what it's worth, I would support a, a focus on testing. And uh, to Brian's point, some special consideration will have to be made because at that time of the, the year, it does get dark quickly. But we've developed some expertise in, in uh, mobile testing and outside testing. So Meharry would be happy to um, help in whatever way to, to make that happen. So I think we should definitely have a focus on testing. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Um, it's uh, just echoing, you know, I trust the wisdom of Dr. Hildreth and this group and um, that feels like a really focused message that makes sense and is compatible with the general public health messaging in the community. So I'd be supportive of that kind of focused approach as well. With a with a focused approach, um, what we've seen with the pandemic and how how to get the word out there for like masks, for example, and how the entertainment and athletic community is encouraging people to wear masks is through a single hashtag. I think it's mask now party later and then having larger organizations sign on to that and promote it themselves. So we should do something like that, to have a very simple statement or hashtag uh, behind our um, more comprehensive messaging that we can then approach other organizations to promote. So I was gonna ask this later because um, I was just gonna ask this at the end when we had announcements, but since we are talking so much about World AIDS Day right now, um, I'm wondering if anybody um, on the call would like to share any World AIDS Day programs that they already have um, sort of in progress. And maybe it's too early for that. Maybe nobody started planning it yet. Nope, okay, never mind then. Eric Nunn, it sounds like it's a really great opportunity for us to um, have that unity around a single message. So um, hearing overwhelming um, support for um, Know Your Status, having a, you know, a set of major testing events around the city. And um, I, I think our, our ask then to move this forward, um, especially as, um, you know, the, the people that are maybe going to be on the planning team aren't going to be the, the key decision makers always on how these mobile units move. Um, just, you know, as we reach out um, um, to connect for, for resources and um, logistical details around clinical um, issues and considerations that might come up because of COVID. Um, and then, you know, probably relying too on um, Amna's team who, who ran their event over the weekend just to, you know, so we can get some lessons learned on that. And anybody else you can connect us, um, you know, the planning team to from your team um, to be a part of the planning would be great. Uh, just a quick question. Um, do we tie it to the COVID-19 at all? Um, because it's, uh, I mean, that is still the big thing. Um, and uh, I hate to paraphrase uh, uh, Gabriel Marquez, but it's like HIV at the time of Corona, you know? So it's, uh, um, I was wondering, it's like, do we tie it in in any way, like the joint testing or uh, anything like that? Uh, thoughts on from others? We, we did go down that route for a while, um, Rajiv, and logistically trying, you know, I think with the conclusion we came to after talking to some of the clini clinicians is we don't want 
people who may be COVID positive mixing, you know, uh, possibly exposing with the exposure risk, um, you know, in kind of a close testing environment and um, logistically trying to do different sets of testing. However, if they're clinical, um, you know, folks at the table who have figured out a workaround or a protocol for that, that um, is more acceptable. I think we, um, you know, Claire, uh, Brian and I had had several conversations um, with uh, also Tariq Smith from, from Meharry and, you know, had pulled in some of the clinical staff from the health department too. And, and that's basically where we, we kept landing was just logistically, it's really complicated to, to mix those two. It, just, a, just a quick note with respect to an outdoor testing event. Um, I, I think what we would do is post really clear signs uh, for any outdoor testing. This is not a place to get COVID testing because uh, right now the, the, we have there are lots of pop-up COVID event, testing events around. And when you see people in the moon suits or whatever, you just assume that's what it is. So we would have to be exceedingly cautious this year and make and post things really carefully. So and make it clear that we're not doing that, so that we don't we're not attracting folks who are interested in the COVID test but remain very focused. Uh, well, thank every thank you everyone for. Um, the rich discussion and the feedback on that. I will um, take this information back to the planning team. And again, if you have anyone who is interested in participating, please um, send them my way. And um, transitioning now, uh, we have Dr. Lauren Brown um, with us today as a guest presenter. Um, she's the Director of Behavioral Health at National Cares, among many other roles as well. And I'm going to figure out how to do PowerPoint and share it at the same time. And Adam, if you can hop on, I realize that this might be the first time I've done a slideshow and shared it at the same time. I just remembered he cannot speak. Never mind. <laughs> We're just gonna, oh, that works, okay. You all can see it? Okay. Julie, you're muted. Sorry about that. I uh, wanted to provide this update to the Advisory Council on um, a project that's in motion through the um, equity work group. So, um, refresher uh, based on the priority areas that the Council had um, uh, developed through that survey uh, about a year ago now. Uh, the forming the equity work group and the charge for that group and that group further into, um, you know, within the specific objectives, what is most um, feasible and um, impactful. And the top for both resoundingly was um, the objective around providing um, trainings online and in person on trauma-informed care and cultural humility. So we pulled together a project team um, and started looking at um, how we can um, move this work forward. But knowing that, um, knowing that um, uh, you cannot change systems and culture through training alone, um, though that's a key component um, of the work. Uh, briefly, just so you can um, see who's a part of that trauma-informed care and cultural humility project team um, or super team. Um, so pretty good representation of different sectors um, and skill sets and um, always looking to um, expand. And our process, uh, as I alluded to, um, looking at the, the, pro the feasibility and impact and then um, recruiting this team. Um, 
So uh, some of the agreements just for how we work, um, engagement with pe of people living with HIV and priority populations is paramount. So um, particularly around perceptions of um, trust, um, safety within the organizations that they're receiving services, um, ultimately with the idea of um, long-term impact going very wide scale, um, large scale and across um, Nashville Davidson County to say, how do we, how do we make it to where there is not a list of organizations that it's safe for you to go to if you are um, a trans person, but that you can go to any of um, the provider organizations in the city and feel like you're going to receive safe, um, psychologically safe, culturally competent or, or culturally humble care. Um, and so I think that's kind of um, my spiel before we turn it over. Um, these are kind of the long-term um, goals that we think will be achieved through um, the actions of this team. And we are um, still pretty early on in development, um, but Dr. Brown can, I'm gonna turn it over to you now, can provide a lot of more information and background on the work that she's already been doing. Thank you so much, Julie, and it's wonderful to be with you guys. Um, you can imagine, um, well, much of my career has um, been spent focusing on trauma-informed care, and in the last um, 10 or so years, um, specifically the intersection with HIV. Um, and so when Julie told me um, that the survey found that it was um, the most feasible and um, I can't remember the other category, the most desired or the thing that was most important, um, that was really exciting for me to hear, especially since at Nashville Cares, we are about three and a half years into um, the initial stages of implementing trauma-informed care. Um, just to be clear before we start, you guys typically end at 3.30, right? Is that correct? Oh, at four, okay, uh, great. So um, I do think that we probably included more slides here than um, we'll have time to get into. Um, typically this training takes me anywhere from an hour and a half to three hours to a whole semester. Um, and so I'm gonna try to squeeze this in and I apologize for going really fast. I'm kind of working on the assumption that many of you have heard about trauma-informed care in some capacity before and have some working knowledge. Um, I'm gonna give a little bit of a general overview though to just make sure we're talking about the same thing. So we are talking about psychological trauma um, and oftentimes people think of this as big T trauma. So these are events that have a lasting effect on individuals. It can be from a natural situation, it could be of human design, um, intimate partner violence, um, sexual molestation, it could be primary, secondary, secondary or vicarious, it could be compounded what we call little T trauma, so something that occurs repeatedly um, that mimics the same effects. Ultimately, um, it's not the event themselves that we are interested in necessarily, it's the impact of the event. So we say the three E's, the event, the experience, and the lasting um, effect of that. So we're interested in what happened for how long and how much um, that would give us our dosage. And so, and then last, not just that something happened, but when we think about the impact, we want to know how it's impacting really the three main important areas of our lives, which is love, work, and play. And that's really how we look to see if something is pervasive on level of um, diagnostic um, and something that we would see as a disorder. Um, so generally, um, neurobiological trauma response, again, it's not the um, impact, it's not the event, it's the response that we're interested in how that impacts specifically people living with HIV. But in general, um, psychological trauma response is seen as something that at worst, um, you know, we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, or acute stress disorder, um, but it's also, it's generally the experience of being overwhelmed um, by what's happened to us. It can affect us on many different levels, cognitively, emotionally, physically, obviously psychologically, um, spiritually, uh, socially. Um, and quite often this impacts our, um, everything about our uh, physiology, but also our, our sense of memory, our ability to, um, our sense of volition to have agency to take action for our lives, um, which obviously can impact our health seeking behaviors. Um, in addition to that, it can have a, a detrimental impact on our immune system as our body is essentially, the autonomic nervous system is essentially an overdrive 
um, in coordination with, you know, something like uh, the global limbic system. If you think of the limbic system and the amygdala as like a smoke detector, which is typically where traumatic events are stored versus the hippocampus. Um, and, and if you have memory stored there, they're implicit, they're not accessible. It's not something that often we can explain in your traditional cognitive uh, behavioral therapy. Um, quite often it's something that we have a sense of alexithymia and the inability to really put words to our experiences. So as you can imagine, this shows up in, um, in uh, behavioral health or just in health sectors in general is something that's really confusing for people who haven't been exposed to what trauma is um, and the need to be trauma informed. Um, so why are we talking about with HIV? Well, because it occurs at such a high prevalence that it's not even considered a comorbidity, it's considered a syndemic. So they're so inextricably connected that you cannot pull them apart. So for example, 70% um, of people living with HIV will have um, two traumatic experiences in their lives. Um, this is 20 times more than general population samples. About 47% of those, I've seen this go all the way up to about 76%, will experience, um, will develop PTSD symptoms. Um, again, compare that to general population samples of about 6%. This is actually higher than veterans as well. Um, and then I have some information here about types of trauma, um, I generally have historically worked on intimate partner violence, um, but now I'm looking more specific to cumulative impact of multiple traumas, HIV specific typology. Um, okay, go ahead. So how does this syndemic work? Well, the mechanisms really reinforcing it, they're complex, they're multi-directional so that um, increased traumatic exposure increases the likelihood, likelihood for HIV transmission or acquisition, and living with HIV increases the likelihood, likelihood for increased um, trauma. I'm trying to move my screen so I can see the whole slide. There we go. Um, so, and then in addition to that, just as the general mechanism, think about um, HIV-specific trauma. So diagnos diagnosis itself, the events surrounding diagnosis, um, long-term associated threat to life, um, and then also um, living with stigmatization, um, which can be different based upon different communities, different geographies, et cetera. Um, some explanations are that, um, as I said, traumatic experiences are cumulative, they're synergistic. Um, in addition to that, they impact our immune system. Um, they lead to high allostatic loads, which overwhelms the body. It robs us of our ability to do typical daily functioning. Um, they lead to mental health, um, uh, things like different types of psychological sequelae that can appear like um, depression. It can also uh, um, just appear like you might he have heard someone say, people are lazy, some people are lazy and they don't really take action to do things for themselves. Um, and so it can, it can give us a sense of abolition that really can just mimic that someone's disinterested or not motivated in their care. Um, but in addition to that, we know that people um, will try many things to cope, to have a sense of balance, and this can lead to substance misuse. Um, obviously, also it can lead to poor medication adherence um, and some, oh, <laughs> hello, um, and then ultimately barriers to care, which um, as HIV practitioners and researchers and administrators, we know this is a big problem, and this is what we're probably most interested in, how this impacts um, unsuppressed viremia and ultimately um, U equals U uh, treatment as prevention. So what are the consequences of this? As I just said, it really leads to um, worse, worse outcomes <clears throat> among our most vulnerable clients and patients, um, really accelerated disease progression, um, that is modifiable, um, and in addition to that, um, a worse epidemic. Um, go ahead. And we know that the significance is that, um, you know, that we're already um, far below the 95% viral suppression um, metrics that we're seeking with ending the epidemic. So to, to see that we're at 46%, we have a lot of work to do, and there are a lot of covert variables that really are driving this and prohibiting us from reaching these targets. And I, um, at Nashville Cares, and as a researcher, and as a practitioner, I'm most interested in this specific syndemic. And so, um, you can go on to the next slide. And so we, um, uh, we probably don't have time to go over this, but basically this just shows how um, intergenerational transmission, epigenetics, implicit bias in our institutions, micro-macro aggressions, 
really drive social emotional cognitive impairment, adoption of risk behaviors, infection, um, unsuppressed viremia. Um, and so this is a NASDAD model. So what is trauma-informed care? Um, essentially, trauma-informed care is a paradigm. Um, it's also considered to be an evidence-based practice, but it means it's a system that's organized to realize that trauma is pervasive. People within the system learn to recognize what trauma looks like, looks like and what its impacts are, and they learn how to appropriately respond so that they're most sensitive um, and do the least amount of harm and, and help the most so that we can resist further traumatizing individuals who often are already traumatized. Um, it does so through six key principles. Um, let me see if I can move my slide so I can see them. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, so as Julie mentioned, um, safety is really critical and they're, these are all really interdependent and that's also the focal point of a lot of my research. Um, specifically how this last one, cultural historical gender issues. I am really getting into the weeds of this. This was newly added in 2014. I'm interested in how a principle, first of all, is called an issue. So we're really looking to operationalize that and understand specifically the role of ethnic and racial equity um, and how it really impedes as and mediates um, all these other principles that are listed here. And then on the left, these are the domains that we have to work in if we are going to actually uphold these principles. And a lot of institutions heavily focus on training and workforce development, screening and assessment, and then just kind of uh, overlook these really important progress monitoring, evaluation. These are really critical because this is our continuous quality improvement, which means, um, yes, this is an evidence-based practice, but we have to use implementation science to do this because without implementation science, we are at risk of bringing in a protocol that may be effective somewhere else, but does not adequately respond to what's happening within our, our own um, individualized institutions. And through continuous quality improvement and evaluation, we essentially create um, center or system tailored uh, roadmaps for what this will look like in each institution. So what we've done locally, um, given that we have about three and a half years in our longitudinal study to implement trauma-informed care um, and develop um, an intervention as part of this, well, we found really high levels of adverse childhood experiences. So um, about 66% had four or more adverse childhood experiences um, to compare, I think it's about 14 to 16% in the general population that have that high. Um, we also found that of those with um, four or more adverse childhood experiences who were in our study, 64% met the di uh, provisional diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. We found that certain trauma exposures uh, predicted post-traumatic stress disorder among our patients, our clients, and those were just a few of them here. And there were several, um, for example, uh, cumulative impact of multiple. But in addition to that, unwanted sexual experiences that were not considered to be the same thing as sexual assault, for example. Um, one second, I'm gonna close the door so my children don't come in here. Um, some other ones were severe human suffering, injury or harm caused um, to someone else, and then other stressful life experiences. And we are currently doing qualitative interviews now to follow up on these quantitative findings to really start to understand gain a richer perspective of what people mean when they say these and to understand potentially how these might be unique to an HIV experience. We found that there's a really high uptake of this intervention. Um, and so people typically stayed engaged um, until they had completed the intervention, uh, leading us to believe that it was feasible in this pilot stage and um, really feeding us to do further, um, further interventions. Um, we also found um, we were excited that it was associated, the, the intervention was associated with clinical and statistical uh, significantly reduced scores for post traumatic stress disorder. So, for example, individuals who had engaged in our trauma team who did not receive the intervention, they were a self selected group. So, that wasn't, it was quasi experimental. Um, however, they did not have statistically significant reduced PTSD scores but compared with those who did opt to go into the intervention group, they did have statistically significant uh, reductions in PTSD scores. So that was a really great finding 
And now we are currently analyzing um, in conjunction and collaboration with within the CFAR, we have gained borrower load data and we are now analyzing that data to see the relevance of those um, scores and outcomes related to viral load. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we developed this intervention through community engagement. So um, it was pure, it was a mix of peers, of researchers, of um, practitioners. Um, so really anyone who was receiving this helped to, to do this. And so um, ultimately we created it's an eight hour or eight hours, so eight week intervention. Hi, Hello. <laughs> um, and so, um, and what we found that was really important is um, it's not just about creating, um, you know, pathology driven outcomes, it's also about resilience. And so we found three resilience indicators that were shown to be protective against um, PTSD. And those were clients' ability to reframe past traumatic events have a sense of hope and optimism about the future and engage in well-balanced activities of enjoyment. So we've now taken those and those are now the staple outcomes of our program. And we are looking at different ways that we can do this type of resilience indicators as outcomes um, within other um, trauma-informed care interventions. Can you put the towel back up? If you can go to the next slide. Yes, ma'am. Um, so just to recap, I didn't bring all this. This is actually from kind of my, my work regionally that I've done throughout the past few years and not all at, at Nashville Cares, but through some work I've done with Emory um, in one of their clinics, um, we did some pre-implementation assessments um, with their, with their um, key personnel and found that all everyone who was um, interviewed believed that trauma-informed implementation was critical that it was a priority because they saw that there were high levels of trauma and the impact on their patients. I think that's really an important finding. Um, let's see, we also found that there are parallel processes that occur between staff and clients relative to trauma response, that what our clients experience, we, um, you know, the work impacts us. This is the cost of caring is that we walk away different from the work that we do. That's an expected thing that's going to happen um, but we have really been looking to see where parallel processes, maybe um, how, where to fault, like how to falsify when those are not ex um, not happening. And what we found is that um, racial discrimination and just the role of race in the workplace really is mediating this and um, means that basically individuals who um, you know are of the same race are more likely to have the same experiences versus individuals just between patients and providers because they're patients they share that they're both patients or both providers um okay you can go to the next one and then so what we're bringing to you today is really that we want to take some of our findings from cares which we're still in preliminary stages of analyses um, uh, but we're, I'm working a lot within the CFAR to um, get some help on analyzing some stuff because uh, there's a lot of data that we've collected. And so all this to say where we are in this moment is we, um, after much discussion, we've decided that the best approach right now, if we're um, really going to implement this um, citywide, is to start with our pre-implementation interviews along the lines of um, implementation science to really work with key informants to understand what people perceive to be barriers and facilitators of us potentially doing this. And um, having this information will help drive this process and it also will um, essentially help with some readiness and to help people understand really what, what to expect and to have a voice in creating what's going to happen. Um, so the first thing is really to um, to conduct those interviews with key informants, um, then to bring it all together, use a consolidated framework for implementation research to um, really organize those themes, to look for barriers and facilitators. And then last, um, because CARES is not the only institution that has worked on trauma-informed care or adverse childhood experiences, Pathways has done this also at Vanderbilt. Um, at the CCC, we'd like to compile a white paper that really details what our baseline efforts have been in this city in HIV um, service spaces. And so um, that will look like us essentially bringing everything together that we have to, uh, to date and, um, and really presenting that within our own internal EHE um, work groups and communities, but also um, doing more with that and using that as a platform 
um, you know, between that and the um, key informants to have preliminary data that we can feed into a much larger grant that has um, potential to uh, really roll this out on a larger scale. So um, the ask of you guys today is um, to consider being a champion of this effort um, to, you know, potentially from what we just talked about, to recognize some of the prevalence, to recognize the importance of this work um, as a syndemic. But then also, if you could help us identify key informants and then help us really provide connections to those key staff members. And I think that's it. Um, Julie, did you want to end with anything? Maybe just some feedback or questions? Yeah, open the floor to um, the advisory council. So I think um, one thing that we're, we're definitely going to be circling back um, to advisory council members on is um, for those key informant interviews once, um, you know, one for feedback on who those uh, should be, but anytime uh, we need to make a direct connection um, to somebody in your organization, um, I think Lauren mentioned that those will happen at you know, multiple levels of staff within the organization and just helping to um, identify and facilitate um, those connections. So I, seeing no feedback or questions at this time, um, uh, Dr. Brown has provided her email address there. Uh, we're going to continue, um, you know, moving this work forward, and um, you know, continue to come back to the advisory council as um, as as needed for input and feedback, and also, um, you know, if there is something we, we need the level of the advisory council to help push up and out. Um, we we hope we can rely on the support of this group because I think this is such a such an important um, component of ending the HIV epidemic. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for being here today. And um, it's fascinating to me just to hear how much you've already um, uncovered within the work that you've already been doing. So I'm really excited um, to move this forward. Dr. Bullock or Claire, I think. I think I'm up next. Um, so we're, we're pretty much wrapping up here just in time. Got about one minute left till the hour. Um, so uh, just a quick recap. Um, so we talked earlier about nominations. So please send any of those to Julie um, or connect directly with um, the person that you'd like to nominate. Um, I think we have some work to do about uh, World AIDS Day, large scale testing events across the city. So expect to hear more from us about that soon. Um, and also um, championing and buying into the trauma informed care initiative that Dr. Brown just spoke about. Um, so with that, I'll ask if anybody has any announcements they would like to make before we wrap up. All right, um, in that case, our next meeting is currently scheduled for November 19th um, from 2.30 to 4. Um, I, it says location TBD. I guess we don't really know yet whether we're going to be meeting in person or virtually. Um, so we'll keep you posted on that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.